Thank you. Our next speaker is Ellen Schrecker. She is a professor of history at Yeshiva University. She is the author of many articles and books, among which are Many Are the Crimes, McCarthyism in America, No Ivory Tower, McCarthyism and the Universities, Cold War Triumphalism, Exposing the Misuse of History After the Fall of Communism, as well as an excellent cookbook on Chinese cooking. Uh, <laughs> and she is currently writing two books. One is a general study of repression in the United States, and one is on contemporary academic, the contemporary academic scene. Um, hi. I timed myself this morning and uh, went way over. <laughs> so I'm going to talk very fast. Uh, and of course, because I've written so much about McCarthyism and civil liberties, I'm often asked whether the uh, current administration's assault on civil liberties uh, is worse than earlier ones. And being I hope a careful historian, I always give a very nuanced reply. <laughs> yes and no. <laughs> uh, one element that is certainly consistent and that my colleague Vijay Prasad uh, noted is the continuity with earlier episodes of political oppression, really from the Alien and Sedition Act up to the present. Um, and one major continuity is the use and the ex exploitation of a crisis as an opportunity to expand the government's power and to silence its opponents. This usually occurs with the rationalization that the protection of national security requires the subordination of ordinary constitutional protections. Um, now, not all the current infringements of people's rights obviously stem from 9-11. Uh, in 1996, for example, uh, Congress and the Clinton administration affected the quote-unquote Anti-Terrorism and Effective Death Penalty Act that created a new crime of quote-unquote material support for a quote unquote, foreign terrorist organization. And it was so vaguely framed that, in fact, if you had given money to Nelson Mandela's ANC, you might have gotten into trouble. But it's clear that 9-11 ramped up uh, political repression. And we need to recognize, I think, the extraordinary level of panic that there was in Washington in the immediate aftermath of 9-11, especially with that, uh, remember the anthrax scare? Mm -hmm. um, and the administration was terrified, just terrified. They really feared a recurrence. And their gut reaction was to get tough. Uh, they, I think, sincerely believed that and I think incorrectly, that coercion was the most effective means of response. And they also, one has to note, took advantage of this crisis to implement a long-standing wish list. The most obvious of these, of course, is the uh, invasion of Iraq, which the neoconservative hawks had been um, eager for. We've seen the CIA, for example, uh, finding it possible to get the administration to sign off on coercive measures that previously had been rendered, uh, been considered politically impossible. We've seen the Department of Justice, for example, um, getting the ability to roll back restrictions on government actions through the USA Patriot Act, which just whisked through Congress. And uh, those of you who know it may realize this is 362 pages of totally unintelligible bureaucratic <laughs> prose, which is mainly amending earlier laws. And it actually took ACLU lawyers several weeks to figure out what was in the law. The crisis also allowed the administration to implement its notion of what came to be called the unitary executive. Um, 
This was a particular project of our beloved Vice President Cheney to restore and expand the powers of the executive branch that he believed had been uh, seriously curtail curtailed in the 1970s after Watergate. And um, this, uh, we see the DNA of this particular project in many of the measures that were taken by the current administration. Above all, I think, in its assumption that it is somehow above the law, and in the many measures that it has taken to avoid accountability, mainly through secrecy. This has been the most secretive administration in recent American history. Uh, we see it as well in the refusal to acknowledge the power of other branches of the government. Um, the Bush administration has defied Congress. We see this, for example, in Bush's quote unquote signing statements in which he will sign a law and then uh, accompany that signature with a weaselly statement that he might not enforce it. Uh, we've seen it as well in measures that were taken to uh, circumvent the courts, especially with regard to surveillance and the detention of prisoners. In all of these measures, I want to emphasize, rely on that invocation of national security and on the claim that they are inherent in the president's powers as commander in chief. Now let's look at some of what's been done and I'll try to compress this as much as possible. Um, let's look, for example, at the illegal detentions and interrogations of, prince, of prisoners, which are clearly the most blatantly illegitimate assumption of power by the Bush White House. And, of course, the administration justifies all these measures as necessary to prevent further, quote-unquote, terrorist attacks. Uh, from the start, the government had been holding people without charges. Uh, in the United States, this began immediately after 9-11 with the roundup and detention of thousands of immigrants, mainly Muslims and people from the Middle East and South Asia. Overseas, we've seen the CIA and the military uh, capturing and detaining unknown numbers of people and the administration facilitating all of that by developing the so-called enemy combatant status in order to evade the Geneva Conventions. Uh, the government has also violated the Constitution by eliminating due process in a number of areas, denying um, the writ of habeas corpus, which would allow people access uh, detainees access to the courts and developing uh, these military commissions that operate without the normal constitutional measures of due process. Um, we've seen Guantanamo as well as at least eight so-called black sites in places we don't know where they are, uh, probably somewhere like uh, Morocco or Eastern Europe. Um, places where the government was trying to ensure that American legal protections did not apply. Worst of all has been the treatment of these detainees, uh, the use of what has euphemistically been called enhanced interrogation practices, i.e. torture, and the uh, practice of renditions in which the uh, government sends prisoners to third countries uh, where, as we know, they will be tortured. There's also been an enormous increase in surveillance, both of citizens and foreigners alike. Uh, under the Patriot Act, for example, the FBI has issued more than 200,000 national security letters uh, to libraries, bookstores, corporations, asking for information about all kinds of people. The National Security Agency, we know, has done a considerable amount of wire, uh, warrantless wiretapping. Um, that the administration authorized in order to avoid legal requirements for review by the uh, so-called FISA courts, foreign intelligence um, security courts. Um, we've seen some successful, some unsuccessful attempts to collect data 
The government has been trying to do a lot of data mining, uh, especially the Department of Defense, and has been collecting information under the rubric, as Alice has pointed out, of terrorism on all kinds of, uh, all forms of internal dis uh, dissent. Much of this has been secret, and I think this secrecy is really a key to the uh, Bush administration's methods of operation, because even before 9-11, if you recall, Cheney was trying to conceal um, the personnel of his um, energy task force from the public, and this has been something that has in only increased after to over time. Uh, and intensified, of course, after 9-11. Uh, in the months after 9-11, for example, the Attorney General began to roll back the Freedom of Information Act, refusing to uh, grant um, access to many government records that had previously been open. The Patriot Act contained so-called gag orders under which institutions who were asked for information on individuals and groups uh, were not allowed to talk about those requests, not even to reveal they had occurred. Uh, the government has uh, greatly increased the number of documents that have been uh, classified uh, roughly 50% of those documents, according to one expert, have been incorrectly classified. Um, particularly serious uh, here has been the administration's reliance on the notion of state secrets as a way of um, making it impossible to bring lawsuits against the government in the area of national security and there has also been, and I think this is just as serious, the use of uh, confidential legal rulings by the administration, uh, by the Department of Justice's Office of Legal Counsel, like the notorious torture memo by John Yeo. There's been uh, outright repression of dissent as well, often as the result of collaboration between federal and local officials that has resulted in the roundup of legal dissenters uh, at the time, for example, of the 2004 Republican Convention in New York, and more recently this summer in St. Paul when the uh, Department of Justice raided uh, a number of uh, dissenting groups. Um, Barbara, I know, is going to talk a little bit about some other measures that have uh, limited academic freedom. So I just want to uh, conclude by asking what kind of generalizations we can make about this Bush and Cheney assault on our basic freedoms. And one that's very obvious is that it's counterproductive. It doesn't increase American security. Uh, people know very well that torture does not necessarily produce valid information, but only the information that the victims think that the torturers would like them to give. Uh, these uh, things like Tor Guantanamo and Abu Ghraib have certainly alienated allies uh, overseas that we that uh, are needed for um, dealing with the issue, uh, and also. Um, from a law enforcement perspective, there's too much information. Uh, the FBI has really found itself swamped. It doesn't have very many Arabic uh, interpreters, and uh, they don't want all this stuff that the NSA has been scooping up. They can't deal with it. Um, more seriously, of course, what the administration has been doing is essentially undermining American democracy and the rule of law. Um, so what should Obama do? It's pretty obvious. Close Guantanamo, end renditions, restore the rule of law, repeal most of the Patriot Act, restore open govern government, end the surveillance of dissenters. Um, you know, it's a pretty obvious wish list. Uh, unfortunately, it probably isn't politically uh, feasible 
to conduct war crimes trials of uh, people like Bush and Cheney, although it is clear, and I just heard a wonderful presentation by the director of the Center for Constitutional Rights explaining that legally these people really are war criminals. Um, so what should we ask for? Maybe some kind of Truth and Reconciliation Commission that would demonstrate that no one is above the law? Actually, I'm not very optimistic about all of this, uh, not optimistic about the fact that uh, it will be possible to avoid similar violations of individual rights in the future. Um, this seems to occur almost inevitably in a time of crisis. And I think unless we can see a greater degree of skepticism within the media, within Congress, within the American population about the um, inevitable uh, demand that we must sacrifice our rights in the name of national security. I think we'll probably see a recurrence some other time. Thank you. <laughs>